This is a disciple, says to his master, how can I come to a supersensual state and hear God speak? In other words, how could he get into the state of consciousness, the state of awareness, where he was so receptive that he would hear the constant song of the universe, the constant song of God. Because this creation cannot exist without that. It is an ongoing song. It's constantly moving. This whole thing, all of this, is constantly vibrating. And it's a dance, it's a song. We don't see that. But this disciple, he asks his master, well, how can I know that? How can I experience that? How can I feel that? How can I sense that? How can I hear that? How can I be part of that and consciously be part of it? And the master answers, when you can throw yourself into that, where no creature dwells, though it be but for a moment, then you can hear what God speaks. Now we're talking about that, where no creature dwells. So it's a place where physically, you cannot go. So it's not in this dimension that we know, this third dimension. So it's not in the first, second, third dimension. Not in the dimensions that we know about. It's that place where no creature dwells. The disciple says, is it near or far away? And the master says, it's in you. It's to be reached by ceasing, even for a moment, from all thinking and willing. When you stand still from self-thinking and self-willing and stop the wheel of imagination and the senses. He said a mouthful just in case you haven't caught on to this yet this master said a mouthful because that's a lot of stuff to do and we can't do any of it we think we can we imagine we can do all kinds of things but we can't do that so what we're talking about is self-remembering and that's really what this master is talking about and that's really what the disciple is talking about the disciple is really asking how can i remember myself because when you remember yourself yourself your true self your created self your real i there's only one thing behind that, and that's God. Whatever God means to people, it's more than that. Whatever God means to you, it's more than that. Your puny idea, your puny experience of what God is, is sadly laughable. What I mean by that is it's not funny, and it's not something to be ridiculed. It's sad what we will accept as what's so, how little we will accept compared to what we could have. That's why I say it's laughable. It's just like a joke. It's a cosmic joke. No, that's not it. And people go around, well, you have to know God this way and that way. And it's, no, it is so far beyond anything like that, that there's nothing to disagree about. People who approach that real eye find nothing to disagree about. Because by the time you get there, you see how it is. And once you see how it is, there are no arguments. People only argue until they see how it is. Once they see how it is, there's no more argument. Can't be. It's impossible. So this act must be done once a day for a short time, is what this work teaches. This act that this disciple is asking this master about has to be done once a day for a short time. That short time, you determine. In the work, they say at least 45 minutes to an hour once a day. In Vipassana, we say at least one hour twice a day. One hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. At least 10 minutes upon waking up before you get out of bed. 10 minutes before you go to sleep when you get into bed. And then whatever else during the day you find yourself inclined to or able to do. And that's a good practice for a good householder. Not everybody will do that. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody's that good a householder, but that's okay. If you're not that good a householder, then learn. That's the great thing about this. If you can't do that now, grow into it. Do the best you can right now. And then tomorrow, do a little bit more. And the next day, do a little bit more. You remember when I started you off in meditation? I started you off with five minutes a day. And five minutes wasn't bad. Everybody could do five minutes. The kids could do five minutes. And then the next week, I think it was five minutes a day for one week. And then the next week, it was add five minutes to it. Now, that was a little more. We doubled it. And that wasn't so bad. Most people found that they could do it. A lot of people found that they'd forget. They wouldn't do it at all. Some people found that they'd be sitting there and then they'd wake up somewhere else going doing something. Because while they were sitting there, they remembered they had something to do. They forgot all about meditating. They get up and went to do it. We slowly became aware, and this is what the work says. Look, you have to practice this every day, for a short time every day. The work says also, don't attempt it too often. 
And the reason they say don't attempt it too often is because we're crazy. We're crazy, broken machines. Think back to Christmas, and if you ever got a toy for Christmas when you were a child that you wind up or put batteries in or whatever, and then you'd play with it for a while, but not all the toys were really that well made, as I recollect. And you'd break a wheel off one, and you'd go to operate it, and you'd go Wee! in a circle, and just turn in a circle. Wouldn't do what it was supposed to do. And we're like that. We're like broken machines. We can't do what we're supposed to do. We can't do what we were made to do. What we do instead is we do these crazy antics that show us that we're really broken machines. So the reason the work says don't attempt it too often is because broken machines are going to do things that broken machines do. And why spin your wheels in a circle if you're not going anywhere when you can go just a little way before you go off, then correct it, and then go just a little way but then you go off again, but then stop and correct it. And if you keep doing that, then you don't get into the spinning thing, spinning in on yourself. This is self-remembering. The supersensual state is a state above the senses, super above sensual. What we're doing is we are actually disconnecting from the five senses. Now, most people can't even imagine doing that. Disconnect from the five senses, I'll be dead. Right. So for a lot of people, that's death. A lot of people, the idea of death is, well, they don't have a body anymore. Well, if you disconnect, if you rise above the senses, if you get beyond the five senses, you're super sensual. You get into a state of super sensualness. You are above, beyond the five senses. They are no longer the doors through which you experience life. You begin to experience life through something else. Well, what else? We can't really talk about that, can we? Now we move into the realm of experience. Now we move into the realm of practical experience. And this is where we lose a lot of people. As long as this is intellectual entertainment, as long as we're going to talk about, oh, these wonderful ideas, and oh, you could do this, and you could do that, and all the things that are possible for man, as long as we're going to talk about that, we'll have lots of people interested. But now we're going to talk about actually doing it. Oh, well, I do it all the time. That's the end of that one. Oh, I've been doing that for years. That's the end of that one. Oh, I don't ever remember time I didn't do that. That's the end of that one. What people do is they imagine that they know what you're talking about. But you don't have to imagine when you've done it. When you've actually practiced self-remembering, you don't have to imagine. You know what it is. You may not be able to visit it as often as you'd like, but you know what it is, and you know when you're really there. You don't always know when you're not really there. But when you're really there, you really know it. There are times when you imagine you're there, and you don't know it until you're really there. Then when you're really there, you go, oh, I was just imagining I was there before. So that's the difficult part about it. What is the life of the senses? All daily worries, cares, contacts, everything you see and hear, everything that comes to you through the senses. We look out at the world, we see there's not enough food. We see that our clothes are wearing out. We see that we need a car, we need a job. We see that we missed the bus, late for work. This is the life of the senses. It's the life that everybody's involved in. If you're on this planet, this is what your life is about. This is the A influence of life. This is what life gives us through the senses. All those things. Well, they're good things, too. It's not just not enough food, clothes wearing out, need a car job, miss the bus. We see war, money, bad news, disease, earthquake, our own face. All sensual. All of this stuff is transmitted to us through the senses. The senses that we trust implicitly. The senses that we have based our entire existence upon. The senses that never lie to us, that always tell us the absolute truth, that we risk our lives believing. And a lot of people go right out the door because they risked their lives believing the senses. Yeah, Steve came up with such a beautiful example yesterday. I loved it. It's his house. He doesn't need the lights on to walk through his house. He knows where everything is. The lights are off. He's walking confidently through his house until he went right into a door of jam face first. And instead of stopping up and yelling and doing whatever we do when we're shocked like that, he stopped and he went, well, isn't that interesting? I was absolutely certain I knew exactly where I was. And I was wrong. I was one and a half feet off. And it cost me running right into this thing with my nose. No hands up, nothing, just wham, because he knew that there wasn't a door jam there. There wasn't a door there. It was just space. And that's trusting the senses. How many automobile accidents will there be today in this country? Hundreds. Why? Because people will be trusting the senses. How many people will fall off of something today and go splat? Plenty, because they'll be trusting the senses. So we implicitly trust the senses, and they consistently lead us astray. Someone walks into the room. You trust your senses to know exactly what they're thinking and feeling about you. 
And then you react accordingly and make your weird, twisted, negative imagination a reality. That's trusting the senses. That's crazy. This is the loony bin of the solar system. <laughs> think, think about it. This is the loony bin of the solar system. People everywhere are doing this right now, every day. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, all these wars, all this insanity. It's all about this same thing. Well, I think that you've got weapons of mass destruction. Well, I think that you're going to do this. Well, I think that I want what you have. Well, I think, and I'm going to, and then we start. And we get committed to something, and it snowballs, and it gets it's bigger and bigger until there's no way to stop it. There's no way to stop it now. And everybody has somebody to blame. Oh, it's the president's fault. He's a warmonger. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. If that man were never born, we would still be in the same place. It has nothing whatever to do with him. But we like to pretend that we know something because our senses told us that it's him. But I promise you, if it wasn't him, it would be somebody else. And if it wasn't that somebody else, it would be somebody else. The senses cannot be trusted. And people who trust the senses end up crazy, insane, because we're broken machines. And a broken machine gets negative. And in case you hadn't noticed, most of the things that the senses bring us most of the time is negative. Well, there are some things that we call positive. Oh, well, she loves me. Really? What about next week? Oh, that, I hate her. Okay, well, that was a positive experience. So the question people really need to ask themselves, is there any other life other than this sensual life? Esotericism speaks of another life. We must transform incoming impressions. These incoming impressions that come through the senses, what esoteric teachings say is you've got to stand at the doorway of the five senses and you have got to transform them as they come in. You cannot allow them to come in raw. You cannot allow them to come in as they have always been coming in. The way your mother and your father and your teacher and society taught you and your culture taught you how to let them come in, taught you how to filter them. You've got to have something else between those impressions and your inner world or else you're going to be crazy for the rest of your life. And if you don't want to be crazy for the rest of your life, then you need something at the door so that it can transform those impressions as they come in. Yet, we're glued to the sensory reality that we're slaves and we can't easily see beyond it. The life events are exerting an influence on us right at this very moment. The sounds that you're hearing, those are familiar sounds. They are so familiar to you. The traffic, the plane, the birds, everything. They're so familiar to you, you take them all for granted. But those are all the cues that tell you where you are, that tell you you're alive. And your life is connected to those senses, those things that are coming in. We're glued to the senses. We're glued to the sensory reality. And so, because we're glued to it, we're slaves to it. Whatever it dictates, that's it for us. That's what we have to do. We can't easily see beyond it. So we're basically right at this moment being hypnotized through the senses by life. The hypnotism of life, the work calls it. But we must free ourselves from outer events. Life is a series of events. It's just this series of events. It keeps on happening one after another. Well, we went to Afghanistan. Well, then we went here. Well, then we went there. Then we had the Gulf War. Then we had the Vietnam War. Then we had, of course, I'm going backwards, but it doesn't really matter which way you're going. It's like having a set of beads, prayer beads. It doesn't matter which way you go with the beads, whether you go this way or that way, you're always going to end up in the same place. And whatever bead you're on is whatever bead you're on. And the next bead is just like the last bead. Oh, it may be a little different, but actually they're all beads. That's what they share. That's the one thing they have in common. It's all senseless. It's all brainless. It's all mechanical. It all just keeps on going over and over and over again. Well, this is the war to end all wars. Mm -hmm. I've heard that before. The First World War was the war to end all wars. The Second World War was the war to end all wars. Now we're so sick of it, we don't even say it anymore. We go, okay, well, the Third World War will be the war to end all wars. Really, then why will we call it the Third World War? We'll call it the Third World War because we know that there will be one after it. We don't like to admit it, but we know it. We know that man has not changed and will not change because he's glued to the senses. He's a slave to the senses, and he can't change because of that. And so we need to free ourselves. Passing time is nothing more than a structure of events on different scales. Personal, family, local, national, world events. And it's all due to 48 orders of laws under which we live. You live under the law of gravity. You live under a lot of laws, a lot of 48 orders of laws, where we are situated this level of experience in the universe. We have a minimum of 48 orders of laws to deal with. It's up to us to begin to free ourselves from the influence of those laws by getting ourselves into higher levels of consciousness where those laws can no longer affect us in the same way. It's possible to do that. You can never be without some event trying to take force from you. Bad news is an event. 
war is an event, but they're not on the same scale. You get a call and somebody says, oh man, your dog got out and chewed up my fence. That's bad news. That's an event, but it's not on the same scale as war. Even if you go to war with your neighbor over it, it's not on the same scale as world war. These events are in different scales. To be under definite laws means that we're not free. It means that life is one thing after another. It means that this event that now has you by the throat, when it is done with you, when it's over, there'll be another event, and that one will grab you by the hair. And if you don't have hair, then it'll grab you by the arm. And if you don't have an arm, then it'll grab you by the leg. But it'll get you somehow. It may grab your eyeballs. It may grab you by the ears. It may grab you by the nose. It may grab you by the tongue. But somehow it's going to grab you. It's going to use the senses and it's going to grab you. You'll be stuck to it. You'll be glued to it. And it will take you on the wildest ride of your life. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll be a boring ride. But it'll take you on a ride. And when it's done with you, you'll be plunked into the next event. That's what it means to be under 48 orders of laws. And it's not a very pleasant experience. Unless it is. But if it is, I can guarantee you one thing. It will change. And unpleasant will come up. Pleasant will definitely turn into unpleasant. For example, Tori now is rubbing her husband's back. There will come a time, if she continues to do that, when her husband will say, okay, that's enough. But if she continues to do it after that, it will be a very unpleasant experience for him. And he will get forceful about it. Knock it off. I don't like that anymore. You get my drift? Pleasant sensations always turn into unpleasant sensations. What we don't understand is that unpleasant sensations always turn into pleasant sensations. But we don't know that. We may know it intellectually, but we have no experience of it. Because we're so attached. We're so glued to the senses. When you begin to notice what kind of being you have, you notice that it weaves a thread continuing the same series of events. What I mean to say is that some events happen to some beings, some people with some kind of being, and totally different kinds of events happen to people with a different kind of being. I've told you, I'm the kind of a being who, I don't ride a motorcycle anymore, and I don't ride a motorcycle anymore because I have the kind of being that there's going to be an accident, and I'm going to be in it. That has nothing to do with being accident prone. That has to do with acquiring a personality in this life that pushes too hard, that drives too hard. And that personality trait is so strong that I have to be incredibly conscious to be doing something that it does and not allow it to run away with me. And I can't be that conscious. Unfortunately, I'm not there yet. Do I hope to be there? Yes, I do. Am I closer now than I was? Well, I gave up motorcycles. That was a conscious choice. I thought, well, if I want to live long enough to learn how to really make these kinds of choices, one of the things that's going to have to go are these motorcycles because this keeps on happening no matter what. And when it keeps on happening no matter what, it's not somebody else out there doing it to me. It's me doing it. It's a harsh thing to have to say to oneself, but there it is. That's the thread that my particular being wove. You can notice your own particular being weaves with its own thread and comes up with something else. What I'm saying is our level of being attracts our life. What that means is our level of being attracts the events belonging to our life. The events that happen in your life, your level of being attracted. When you change your level of being, the events in your life will change. When I was in high school, actually when I was in grade school, I used to get into fights. When I was in high school, I get into fights, but they didn't go as well for me. And so when I got out of high school, I decided, you know, I don't really want to be in any more fights. This is a low percentage thing to do. And so I stopped getting into fights. And how I did that was I changed my level of being. Instead of getting argumentative when somebody said or did something that I didn't like, I remembered, I don't want to get in fights. I brought that volition, that idea that I didn't want to get in fights anymore, right up to where the impressions were coming in. And so when the impression would come in, somebody was being obnoxious or argumentative, and I would usually react in a certain way, I would bring that idea up, and I would transform the incoming impression. Maybe he's having a bad day. Maybe he's just a jerk. Maybe all he wants to do is fight, but I don't want to fight, so I'm not going there. And I'll go somewhere else. It began to work. And I stopped getting in the fight. It's a small thing. But for some people, it's not a small thing. There's some people who've been getting in the fights their whole life, and they're still doing it. Now they're down at City Hall, and they're fighting there. Or they're out with a picket sign, and they're fighting there. They don't want the illegal aliens here. They don't want illegal aliens to have to go home. Or they don't want us to pay for the illegal aliens' health care. Or they want to pay for the illegal aliens' health care. It doesn't matter what it is. They want to fight about something. I'm not one of them anymore. I'm not saying that people who want to fight are bad people. I'm just saying that's just a level of being that I don't choose. That's all. I don't want any part of that. So we end up saying things like, why does this always happen to me? Well, because you're your level of being. That's why it always happens to you. 
And when you wake up a little bit, you realize when you're lying on the freeway and you just had a motorcycle wreck and you say, why does this always happen to me? Well, because you're riding a motorcycle. Oh, yeah, that's right. I wonder if it would stop happening if I stopped riding a motorcycle. Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, it would. But that's not freedom. I have to give up something I want. No, you don't. You just have to decide what you want more. Sliding down the freeway sometimes and riding down other times or never sliding down the freeway. Never sliding down the freeway works for me. Okay, then get off the slider. Isn't there another way? Well, there may be, but it's not open to me right now. And when it is, then we'll talk about it. There are times when self-observation is no good. Then you can say, I wish to remember myself. You'll find the work will help you. There are times when you can't observe yourself. You can't do it. But at that time, you can say, I wish to remember myself. I wish to remember myself is not just some mantra. It's a genuine emotional response to the fact that you can't observe yourself, that you can't disconnect from the senses, that you can't separate from the senses, that you can feel you're being dragged away. You can feel that you're being taken captive by the senses. You can feel that life is kidnapping you through the five senses. And you don't want to go, but you can't stop it. But what you can do is you can cry for help. And I wish to remember myself as a cry for help, and the work will help you. I don't want you to believe that, because if you believe that, you go nowhere. I want you to verify it. If you will try that and see if it works, then you'll know. You won't have to believe anything. We have enough belief. We don't need more belief. What we need is more experience, practical experience, where we did it and we know now because we did it. We forget to remember ourselves. We wonder what to do, but we forget to remember ourselves. In life, we're always looking for what to do. Oh, I'm bored. I'm bored. What should I do? Well, try remembering yourself. That'll cure your boredom instantaneously. You'll have plenty to do then. Everything in the world through the five senses is going to try and stop you from remembering yourself because it doesn't want you to remember yourself. Because that's not how that game is played. That's how that game is broken. That's how you get out of that game. How you get out of the game of insanity is to become sane. Then to become sane, you must remember yourself. You must know who you are. People who are insane are people who think they're Napoleon or Alexander the Great or Hitler or Catherine the Great or somebody like that. Oh, yeah, I'm Sigmund Freud. I'm Jesus. Uh, those people are insane. They're not those people. Well, in a past life, that's who I was. Yeah. I want to talk to the guy who was nobody in a past life. Everybody I've ever talked to who could remember their past lives was like some really big, important person. I never talked to someone. Oh, just some jerk who had two kids, and I left my wife, and then I got this other wife, and she was a jerk, too. And look, I was a jerk. I beat my kids, and I beat my wife, and I was so stupid, I can't remember my name in a past life. You know, I want to meet that guy, but I never met that guy. I always meet Jesus and one of the disciples, you know, or St. Germain or somebody else. I always meet these other weirdos, or Hitler. I guess I've never met Hitler, either. Maybe I have. The work moves away from us, and we pass into life. Then we need to self-remember. It opens us up to the influence of the work. The work moves away from us. We stop valuing it. We forget about it. And then we pass into life. We just, like, slip into life. And the next thing you know, life starts getting its grubby mitts on us, and it starts pulling at us and twisting us around and dragging us wherever it wants us to go. And we like it, usually. It's only when it starts to get nasty that we wake up and go, Oh, help, help! Then we want out. And that's when you need to begin to remember yourself. And that's usually when we begin to remember ourselves, when life gets nasty. We go, wait, it doesn't have to be like this. I remember when it wasn't like this. So we're opened up to the influence of the work. To remember oneself is a surrender of oneself. One realizes one's helplessness. You realize that you are a captive of life, that you are in prison. And then you remember, wait, I don't have to be. I don't have to be in this prison. There was a time when I was a little freer than I am now. That's remembering yourself. It's impossible to self-remember if we don't realize that there are better influences that can reach us. You've got to believe that there's something more. You've got to believe that there's something higher than you. If you don't believe that there's something higher than you, you're not listening to this. See, people who don't believe there's something higher than them, they can't even hear what I'm saying. They can't even listen to it. They could not get this far. There's no way. Not even to mock it. They couldn't even stay the distance to mock it to find out what was wrong. They couldn't even oppose it. They couldn't even stay the distance to oppose it. They would have already turned it off. It's difficult to self-remember when we're identified with life. It's also difficult when we have a wrong attitude toward the work. If you look at this work like intellectual claptrap, forget it. You're not going to remember yourself. You're on a life level. You're dealing with this work at a life level. And if you're dealing with this work at a life level, this work is useless to you. You've got to get beyond that. When we begin to practice self-remembering every day, we become aware of a continuity that is running through our life and has always run through our life. 
It's always been there, but we have been unaware of it. A lot like the discoverers and the explorers when this continent was new. They'd start at the east coast and they'd head west. Why did they head west? Well, because you can't go east when you're on the east coast. They went the only way they could go, which was west. Well, they could go north and south from there, that's true. But eventually they would move west, and then they would find rivers. Well, that river had been there for thousands of years, but it was new to them. And so it's the same thing for us. We begin this inner journey, and we find a continuity running through our life, like a river. And it's always been there, but we were never aware of it. Or we came upon it here, and then we came upon it there, and we called it two rivers. But it wasn't two rivers, it was the same river. We just found it in two different places. And the more we map our inner world, the more we see the continuity of the river that's running through it. Now, that's just an example that popped into my head, and that's why I'm sharing it. But you get the idea. When continuity is lost, we become aware of it. Then we have a point in the work in the emotional center. This is an inner taste. It's the beginning of real work conscience. You start to get a taste of the water in that river. It's clean, it's pure, it's sweet, it's alive. The sun is shining on it, purifying it. It's bubbling over the rocks. It's being aerated. The impurities are being taken out of it. And it's going back to its natural state. You know, these rivers in this country, they used to be clean, pure. People could go and drink right out of them. You can't do that now. It's not just a Saturday Night Live joke about the Great Lakes. Jesus came back today, could walk across the Great Lakes just like everybody else can. You know, there's so much garbage in them. Of course, that's not entirely true. But you get the drift. It's like they're not as pure as they used to be because we have dumped so much garbage in them for so long. And they can't heal themselves because we keep wounding them. That's how it is with us. We've got to find the purity within. And when we do, we'll get a taste for it. When you get a taste for it, you know when you're off and you know when you're on. And that becomes your guide. That becomes your beacon so that you can begin to navigate your internal world. That's what self-remembering is about. And that's what I'm talking about.